So we're going to be looking at some of these expectations uh, just as a precursor to that. What happens when people have expectations or assumptions that then turn out to be false? How does it affect people's faith or their doubts sometimes? It undermines, it undermines their faith. Would you agree with that? Do, we, do you encounter people sometimes that have some, obviously, some false expectations and you've seen how that that's undermined their faith, but the, the problem is not really God, it's really their expectation or their uh, assumptions. Why do you think that happens? Do you think Christians can sometimes have false expectations or assumptions? Okay. All right, so we're going to look at that again today. So we've been looking at the uh, topic of doubting Christianity. Uh, first week, we kind of gave an overview. Last week, we looked at more traditional things when you think about uh, doubts in Christianity. We looked at some cognitive issues. They were going to be looking at what I characterize as doubts of the heart uh, that really aren't so much believing a factual thing, whether it's true or not. It gets its sort of our emotional reaction to things and somehow uh, how those can create sort of crises of belief or faith. For example, maybe you have uh, one of your children or something has walked away from God and you're struggling with how can that happen, uh, or things of that nature. So uh, uh, hopefully you'll uh, enjoy looking at some of these types of issues today. Before we do that, let's go and open with a word of prayer, though. Dear God, just thank you for this day. Thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. We thank you for the sunshine today after the rain. Uh, and Lord, just ask you be with us as we look at the issue of our hearts uh, and false expectations and assumptions that we may sometimes have about you and how that affects our faith and affects those around us. We just ask all that you be with us uh, in all these discussions in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so uh, a couple weeks ago, I kind of laid out an outline for our course. We've been looking at different uh, factors relating to faith or more specifically doubt. Uh, last week, we looked at certain some traditional cognitive issues about the existence of God uh, and the reliability of, of God's Word. Today we're looking at the issue of doubts of the heart, and more specifically, we're going to look at three different types of doubt, doubts that are created by false assumptions, doubts created by false expectations, and then doubts created by ingratitude, which is something we may not sort of associate with doubt, but <clears throat> I think there's a strong correlation we want to look at. So uh, a couple weeks ago, I kind of gave you a, a model of thinking about our, our, our faith in totality as a structure that's, bi that's built on different uh, fundamental building blocks. And we looked at there's really three elements of faith. There's a cognitive element that's, that's based on truth. There's a uh, affective or an emotional element based on desires. And then ultimately, there's a volitional component that's based on choice. And we looked at how we can strengthen our faith by strengthening those elements. We also looked at how doubts can uh, be created in our, our uh, soul as each of those are undermined potentially. And last week, we kind of looked at some externalities of how doubts can uh, affect those. Today, I want to look at some, some doubts that can occur somewhat within if our faith is built on some uh, faulty building blocks. And so we're going to look at three of those. The first looking at instead of having our faith based on truth, it gets based on false assumptions. Or instead of our, our faith based on an affection for God, uh, it gets built on certain expectations we have of God. And then finally, looking at the issue, do we choose to be thankful or we choose not to be thankful? That ultimately cuts down to a choice and how ingratitude can also be a faulty uh, building block, so to speak. And if, if our structure is built on falsehoods, ultimately when those get exposed, which they typically do through life, then that can create a crisis of belief in people uh, if, they've, if they've not had a solid foundation. So we want to look at first false uh, d assumptions and how those can create doubts. And so I'm, I'm going to list a few sort of assumptions that sometimes people have. I want to talk about what are the ramifications of those if those turn out not to be true. So, for example, uh, 
Uh, what about the statement, one must obey the Old Testament laws in, in order to be a Christian? Is that true or false? Were there at times Christians that thought that might be true? Can we think of the New Testament examples of that? Right, the whole issue with the Judaizers and Galatians, Paul kind of addresses that. So if you believe that and that's not now found to be true, do you think that kind of created a crisis of belief for some of the Jewish believers? That was something they had to kind of work through. Certainly the, we, we see at Athens when the folks from Jerusalem came up, the controversy that created and how that uh, was disoriented for them. Again, that kind of falls back, as we'll see in a little bit later on. We tend to have expectations about God, and when God doesn't fit our expectations, that causes some problems. Uh, so as I mentioned, Galatians, Paul talks explicitly that that's not true, that our salvation is based not on our works, but on Christ totally. Uh, here's another assumption. A person must cooperate with God's grace to generate good works to warrant God's justification. Is that true or false? That's, that's biblically false, right? Is there a major, uh, is there a major quote-unquote denomination? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I mean, this, this is the, one of the fundamental beliefs of Catholicism, right? That God's, you, you cooperate with the grace that God gives you, you do, you do good works based on the works that you produce. God then credits uh, a goodness to you that he then justifies you. So if you believe that, what problems can that have relative to your faith? That's right. You get into this mentality that you're having to earn God's favor. That can create all kinds of things. Uh, it can start to create pride or if things don't work out in your life, you start to say, this isn't fair. I've done all this stuff to work to get God's favor, and yet he's not giving me favor. God can't be relied upon. Therefore, I can't trust God, and so on. You see how those doctrinal errors can start to creep in and undermine a person's faith. Okay. So again, in Ephesians, Paul addresses this as well. He talks about that our salvation, our justification, is a gift of God. It's not a result of works. All right, and you can get a uh, if you if you combine try to combine sanctification and justification as as Catholicism does, you can have some problems that come out of that. Uh, what about this question? Well, a person becomes a Christian by grace; he must rely on his works for his sanctification. This may not be quite as cut and cut and dried, so to speak. In some people's mind. Do you think that's true or false? Okay, that's false. Do you think there's a lot of Protestants that believe that? I think we all do at times, don't we? Yeah, it's like, well, God, God's, um, he saved me, but now it's up to me to, to really, uh, to exert my effort to, um, basically become more holy or and so on. Now, I'm not diminishing the fact that there's an active involvement of our will in the process of sanctification, but if we think somehow that our actions are what's generating our sanctification as a result of that, that's just not biblical, okay? And just as an example, again, we can go back and look in Galatians and Colossians where Paul dismantles that argument, uh, and he talks about in Galatians, uh, again, he, he's talking to the Galatians because they have conflated works with salvation. He says, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, that is, having become a Christian, are you now being perfected by the flesh? And he answers categorically, no. Our sanctification is just like our justification. They're both a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's not... A, God's done this for me, now I have to do this for him. You, 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 you're, when you do that, you're trying to fall back into sort of Old Testament uh, covenant theology where 
If I obey God, then God's obligated to do this for me. If I do all these good works, then God's obligated to sanctify me or so on. Uh, is everybody understanding the distinction I'm making there? Okay. Uh, and then in Colossians, he, gets, he goes through a bunch of examples of how people are trying to be sort of, quote, holy. And he says, these have indeed the appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and cynicism but, and severity to the body, but they have what? They have no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. I mean, what the gospel says is we're not bad, we're incapable of doing good. The Holy Spirit has to be acting in our lives to equip us to do anything. Uh, that's why Jesus talked about in John about we have to abide in him. That the, the fruit that's produced only comes as a byproduct of him working through us. We're just the conduit through which that happens. We're not actively producing fruit, okay? Uh, so if you believe that, though, if you believe that we have to sort of work out and produce our salvation or our holiness, what problems can that create as far as potential doubts that can arise in a person's life? Yeah, okay, this is not fair. I'm doing all this stuff, and I'm not getting my expected return. Okay, it's this whole mentality. We all tend to fall into that. Our culture certainly reinforces that. And unfortunately, even sometimes there are, uh, there are stories in the Old Testament that tend to reinforce that, and we tend to extract things out of the Old Testament. And, and we're now living under a new covenant, and we, we try to live under an old covenant. It's the same thing that the Galatians were guilty of. Okay, uh, So that can really set us up for these expectations that creep in based on these false assumptions that set people up for doubt. Um, and this one's similar to that. It says, if a person fulfills the conditions of an Old Testament promise, either through faith or works, then God is obligated to fulfill that promise. And this will make you a little dicey here. We'll see how this goes. Okay. Um, what about that statement? Okay, do we, do we sometimes live as if God is obligated to us? Okay. All right, let, let me throw something up that I'm sure we've all seen before. Um, this, is, this is a proverb that says, Train up a child in the way he should go, even when he's old, he will not depart from it. What, what do a lot of people, maybe you do this, how do you, how do you evaluate and apply that proverb? Okay. Do a lot of people look at that as a promise? And, and how do they act on that promise? What's the expectation that comes with that? It's that I did my part. Look how they turned out. Yeah. So, so if, if I have raised my children in a Christian environment, I've taught them, then I have a contract with God, and he's, he is obligated to make sure they're saved, and then... Uh, get them to heaven. I've I've done everything I can do, so it's all up to him. Your children have a free will, too. They do have a free will. Okay. If you believe that, what what are some of the things that can come out of that? If you have a wayward child or a child that walks away, it's got problems. I've got a close friend of mine, uh, a very godly guy. Both him and his wife, whose son. Uh, got into drugs and committed suicide, not intentionally, but over OD. So did God fail that quote-unquote promise or not? Well, if God doesn't fail, then he's always a parent. I mean, you're on the hook for everything that ever happens. So. Okay, but then what happens if you interpret that as a promise and you then you interpret that I've somehow failed to execute my part? What's the resultant experience for a parent under that circumstance? They're taking all this guilt on them, okay? How is that guilt going to affect their relationship with God? It, what's that? Exactly, okay? You know, how, why, I tried to do the best I can. You, God, you failed me. How, why, why can I trust a God like that? Do you ever run into people that have walked away from their faith because of what's happened with their kids? Okay, yeah. Yeah. 
that happens quite frequently. Why is that? We have to remember some. The Proverbs are not promises. They are general principles. Okay? Does everybody understand that? That's why they're called Proverbs. They're not called promises. A lot of people have been raised, and I was raised that way, Proverbs are promises. You take them as promises, but that's not really what the Bible says. Okay? So if you're, if you turn a proverb into a promise and you place your faith on a proverb instead of God and, and his trustworthiness, then you can have challenges. Uh, here's, here's a psalm. It says, because you have, you have made the Lord your dwelling place the most high, who is my refuge no, refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague will come near your tent. Okay. This is a little more maybe dicey. So, if, if I'm a Christian and I go to Iraq, does that mean I'm not going to ever get killed? Okay, well, does, is that, isn't that sort of a promise or not? Okay. Uh, so let me, let me suggest this is all such psalms have an unspoken qualification. No evil shall be allowed to befall you or play come near your tent without God's permission and design. That's sort of an implicit uh, point behind that. Such promises are statements of exact sweep and providence, not a charm against adversity. What it does assure us is that nothing can touch God's servant outside his will. Do we sometimes try to take verses out of the Bible and make them into charms? When we do that, who is now being elevated, God or the charm? Why do we do that? It's easier for us, right? Think about the Israelites. Here they had an encounter with God that had brought them through the Red Sea and what did they do? Did they wait on God or did they make a charm? They made a charm, right? Because they wanted to hold on to something tangible to try to deal with their anxieties or whatever. And so when we make God into a charm, what's going to happen? We place expectations on that charm that when they fail, how's that going to affect our faith? Yeah, disappointment, right? So what is, is, is God let us down or is our charm let us down? How is it any different from the Israelites building these idols as charms, right, to try to get what they wanted instead of having a relationship with God? So that's another example where we can do that. It's fascinating. If you go back and look at Psalms 91, Psalms 91 is the psalm, that Satan quoted when he tempted Jesus. He said, well, the Bible says this, so you should just jump off here, right? Because God will take care of you. And so Satan was actually quoting Psalms 1 in the context of a charm, and, and Christ rejected that interpretation. Right. What I'm trying to do is make sure, well, that's the other thing. We, as, and this gets back to the charm issue. We want certainty, and we don't want a God that's, that is myst, mysterious, that we, we, have, we don't understand sometimes, but yet we're called upon to trust him. We see that pattern throughout Scripture. God is not obligated to explain everything to us, but the absence of certainty or the existence of a mystery is not, a, I would argue, a a deficit of God, it's another example of his existence. If we could build a God in which we could explain everything, then we really have kind of explained away God in doing so. Yeah, it, it is. In a sense, we do have, that's exactly what we have. We have sort of this pious superstition, and then when we lose a game, well, how do we react to that, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, uh, let me give you another one. It says, it is always a sin for a Christian to be anxious and depressed. Is that sort of an assumption a lot of people make? Okay. Uh, yeah, 
they do, but I would argue that's not true. There's all kinds of examples. In, in fact, if you look in, in Paul's life, it's obvious he dealt with depression. He dealt with anxiety. Uh, and in the context even of those descriptions, it's obvious that Paul was not sinning or anything when, when those things were happening. Okay, uh, it, For those of you all who took my course on anxiety and depression, we, we really dissected that that whole topic in detail, but yet there's a culture, there's a lot of cultural expectations or assumptions we have in churches. If you believe that and then suddenly you're afflicted with depression, how, what's the spiritual implications of that if you believe the, that statement? Okay, one of those two, okay, that's not a healthy result for a Christian relative to their faith, is it? Okay, you see how all these little assumptions we make start to undermine our faith in different ways that we don't even think about. Okay, uh, a person should always put out a fleece to know God's will. Anybody grew up in a church where that was kind of taught implicitly, if not explicitly? The pastor talked about the reason he knew how to come to that church. God told him because he prayed that there'd be two professions the Sunday he, he preached, and there were two professions, so that was proof that God wanted him to come. Okay. Okay. That's certainly, that's certainly one thing. It's, funny. it's not funny. It's interesting. If you go back and look at Gideon, remember where he put out the two fleeces, and God allowed him to do that. I don't know if you ever noticed then, what did God do? He then reduced his army twice. Those are related. Okay? So God showed, okay, you, you want this. I'm going to prove that you have to depend on me, not a fleece. First, he reduces his army once, and he reduces it twice. And those go back, I believe, to those two previous incidents where he put out a fleece. God was saying, no, you have to depend on me, not some externality. Okay, um, And so Jesus told us that it's the Holy Spirit we rely on. I, again, you can get into subjectivity like you're talking about, right? But we shouldn't be depending on externalities because when that happens, again, it almost comes back to the superstition type of operation. Okay. Uh, what about Christian leaders are always right and will never disappoint you? Does anybody believe that? Yes. Are there people in a church that believe this? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so if your faith is based on a person, that's a huge false stone that your your faith is based on, right? Uh, so we know there's all kinds of examples. We'll look at, uh, you know, when, when Paul uh, basically con confronted uh, Peter. It's like... Dude, this is not right what you're doing, okay? Uh, even Paul himself, remember the fight he got in with Barnabas? Okay, so we're all fallen people, even the, well, certainly the people in the Old Testament and the New Testament, all right? Uh, and leaders today are just as fallible as everybody else, okay? And if you're a leader and you're thinking you're not, you're in big trouble, okay? Uh, how about it seems unfair... For here, here, let me shift here. We're, I'm going to get into the issue of hell because this is another issue I see a lot of people really struggling with. Uh, it seems unfair for God to condemn to hell those people who would accept Christ if they were just presented with the gospel. Do you ever hear this argument? Okay. Well, first, like we did last week, let's step back and think about what does the Bible reveal about God? There's a lot of things related to salvation of folks that Scripture talks about what are some of these verses here? Uh, what do they what do they explain or highlight? Do you think our our culture out there thinks that? Are, are there some quote unquote Christians go around basically giving a view of God that's not accurate, perhaps? Uh, but certainly, God is a God of, of love. We know uh, He's patient. He's He's kind. He wants people to come to repentance. Um, continuing on with that argument, what some other issues? Why do people, though, ultimately end up in hell? Scripture says what? What do they do? 
they suppress the truth. We're always we're all, we're all linked. We're all guilty of suppressing the truth, aren't we? Okay, we like to we like to communicate the truth to other people, but we don't really like to have the truth communicated to us. Certainly not by other people. Would you agree with that? Okay. Um, another reason is people make judgments on people. That's another why. Another reason why people ultimately end up in hell is because they suppress the truth, but yet they're also making moral judgments on others, and God ultimately will hold them accountable to their own moral judgments. Um, and then ultimately because they have hard and impenitent hearts, Scripture says. People turn their hearts away from God. Uh, another reason, I think, uh, is what if they were presented with the gospel? Look what, look what Jesus talks about in talking about um, Lazarus in hell, or Lazarus' former owner or uh, employer in hell, and Lazarus outside, and the, and the man in hell is pleading with Abraham to send someone from the dead to talk to his brothers. And Jesus says, look, if they didn't listen to the prophets, if they didn't listen to the other evidence I gave them, then they're not going to believe in Jesus. So the presumption that people have is somehow if God's gospel was just communicated, then these people would naturally accept it. Or, there, or there's an assumption that there's people out there like that. And I would argue, as we'll see in a second, that maybe that's not the case. There's an interesting passage in Acts where Paul's talking to the Athenians, and he makes a, a, a statement I think a lot of people may skip over, but I think it has some profound theological implications. He says, "And God made from every, uh, and God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the earth and the face of the earth and determine their appointed times and their boundaries and their habitations." The implication here is if we apply that to individuals is that God has preordained where individuals are going to be born, where they're going to be born, what time they're going to be born in, and so on. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So let me give you a little uh, analogy that William Lane Craig, who's a, a Christian philosopher and apologetist, uh, apologetist gave, uh, and, and what people's cultural assumptions about hell uh, as related to that. So if we have the world, we have people that are exposed to the gospel and people that are not exposed to the gospel. And what Craig suggests is that before God created the universe, he knew from his foreknowledge exactly who would accept him and who would not accept him. And so he argues that knowing the people that would accept him, and you can apply this either from a Calvinist perspective or an Armenian perspective, that God then placed individuals on the earth at specific points and times and environments where they would ultimately be exposed to the gospel and they would, they would accept Christ. Conversely, he knows people that will not accept him, and those people that he knows will not accept them, he places in situations on the planet where they're not exposed to the gospel, but they are exposed to general revelation as, as discussed in Romans. Therefore, they're still responsible for the knowledge they have, as we've just seen a few other verses. Uh, and that way that those people that do not or will not accept him are, are not exposed to that. The presumption a lot of people have is that there are people out there that God knows will accept them, but yet he puts in a situation where they're not exposed to the gospel. And he argues those people don't exist. There are no people like that. Uh, what there are, however, are people that he knows will reject him, but he does expose to the gospel. And you might ask, why is that? And Craig argues potentially it's because in the spectrum of disbelief, there are those whose disbelief is much more strident than other people. In fact, Jesus uses an example of the variations of people's belief in the associated responsibility and judgment in Scripture when he talks about Chorazan and Bethsaida and says 
if the things that had been done in uh, Tyre and Sidon had been done to you, they would have repented. But since you have been given this extra knowledge, you're still strident. You're therefore much more responsible. So he makes the argument that there are certain individuals whose hearts are so hardened against God that God's judgment upon them ultimately is not to put them in a situation where they're not exposed to the gospel, but they are exposed to the gospel. Therefore, their responsibility and their judgment are more severe, which is somewhat sobering when you think about our Western culture. We tend to think that we're more godly than the pagans. It's very possible that our Western culture is populated by a lot of individuals whose strident unbelief is worse than those who have never heard the gospel. And this is a way that God then places responsibilities on them that ultimately they will be held accountable for. Does that make sense? So it gets back to the argument, what about those people that never heard? I think this is at least one possible explanation of that that at least coherently uh, unified. Uh, I love this quote by J.P. Moreland who says, in the final analysis we remember that hell is not a place where people are consigned because they're pretty good people but they just didn't believe the right stuff. They're consigned there for first and foremost because like Satan, they continue to defy the maker and want to be the center of the universe. This presumption that God is this horrible ogre is just trying to torture people because he's this sadistic monster like Dawkins alluded to last week is just a totally false assumption. Um. Another argument I've kind of seen that's sort of related to that, it says, it seems arbitrary and just for God to keep in hell those who ultimately would repent, but God isn't loving enough to forgive them and release him. This concept that there are people ended up in hell and they just got there because they were just, uh, they were uneducated. Now they see the error of their ways and they want to repent, but God's locked the door and won't let them out and he's just keeping them there. Okay. Uh, the question is, does that person really exist? There's an assumption that he does, but I think we have clear evidence from Scripture that, that he does not. If you look over in Revelation, there's an interesting and very sobering passage that says, The fourth angel poured out his bowl of the sun and was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues, yet they did not repent and give him glory. No. They knew here God was clearly evident and they knew they were in judgment before God, and they didn't repent. They did what? They just cursed him. And I would argue that is the, that is the population of people who are in hell. It's not these people begging to get out. It's just the opposite. So there's this presumption that, about God that is just totally uh, fallacious. It says, hell will not be filled with people who have not finally come to their senses and who are repentant. Only God isn't nice enough or good enough to let them out. It will be filled with people who for all eternity still want to be at the center of the universe and will persist in their God-defying rebellion. The great tragedy of our day is there are billions of people walking around whose own rebellious spirit has been rationalized from away from their conscious mind. On Judgment Day, however, it will be finally revealed. The great horror will not be that such people will finally renounce it, but they will continue to embrace it. And so in the end, God will give them what they want, their freedom and an eternal existence devoid of his loving presence and glory. It's a certainly different perspective of hell than most people have, I think, isn't it? Um, it's a, there's a fascinating passage in 2 Thessalonians that talks about hell. Uh, and talking about those in hell, it says they, they shall suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. I want to break that down for a moment. So what is hell? Hell is a place where God allows people to continue to pursue an eternal existence of self-centeredness. This pursuit leads to an incremental destruction of their intrinsic personhood. In the end, such people turn into interpersonal black holes. What are some of the characteristics of a black hole? Nothing escapes. Nothing escapes. Okay, it's just all centered on itself. It, it collapses on itself. 
So in essence, hell is a state of being where people continue to focus on themselves over and over. And just like in a physical example, they basically collapse on themselves. That's a horrible situation, but it's one that's self-imposed. Therefore, in the end, God does not destroy people. He gives them the freedom to destroy themselves. So this, this assumption that people have about this God that's out there, this ogre won't let people out because he's just mean and so on, doesn't exist. Uh, or it's a deceit that, that Satan has propagated to blind their minds from the truth. It also says hell will be a place where they are excluded from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his might. Hell is simply a place where God's presence and glory do not exist. And I don't think people today have any concept of what that can possibly be like. The closest thing I could, I could associate with that is, as I've already alluded to some of y'all, several years ago I had a mental breakdown and I was in deep depression, suicidal, and so on. And my whole mind basically had stopped functioning. And that literally was an opening, a picture of what hell is like. It, there is no words that can describe that. And the assumption that people going around, uh, you know, well, if I go to hell, you know, I'll still have all my faculties and so on. You have no, you have no assumption or, or basically basis of believing that um, and so hell is horrible it's more horrible than we can possibly imagine uh, and if you can take the experience of suicidal depression and multiply that by a million you still haven't achieved what that's going to be like that should motivate us certainly to, to have a greater passion and desire to witness to people uh, but it also, I think, puts aside this, this arrogance of, of the assumption that, well, I can just reject God and, and you know, we'll just see what happens. Okay. Uh, it's, it's horrible. Not because God is this monster. It's because he's taken away what you've presumed is yours. Every good gift we have is, is a gift of God. Um, Another fascinating insight on this topic comes from the story of the rich man and Lazarus. It's very interesting if you look at that passage. There's just several things I want to point out. First of all, the rich man does not join, does not ask to join Abraham. There's a gulf there, but he doesn't beg, you know, get me out of this place. Okay. He remains steadfast in his rebellion. He recognizes repentance is necessary for salvation. Because he wants the Abraham to send somebody to tell his brothers to repent, but yet he's still not exhibiting any repentance of his own. It's, other, it's also fascinating, if you go back and look, the rich man continues to treat Lazarus as his servant. He's still arrogant as possible. He, he, wants, he, wants, he wants Lazarus to bring him water, just like he did on the earth, okay? Like Abraham. Like, uh, Lazarus is still his servant. It's a fascinating insight into his thinking process. Uh, notice the man doesn't request release from hell. He just wants to experience comfort in his rebellion. And notice the rich man does not have a name or identity. He's never named. Lazarus is named, but the rich man is not named. That's significant, I think, because sin and self-centeredness ultimately leads to a destruction of self and a loss of identity. And then finally, the man is in torment because, like I've talked about, removal of, God's, of God includes a removal of God's inherent blessings. Those things all go out the window. Uh, a final thought on this, one of my favorite movies is The Sixth Sense with uh, Bruce Willis. And what's fascinating about this character, has everybody seen this movie? <laughs> Okay, yeah. So, 
what is fascinating, he's, he goes through the whole movie assuming that he's alive, he's real. And not only does he do that, who else does that? Not just the little boy, but who else? The viewers, right? We believe that too. And it goes all the way to the end, and then at the end we have this bizarre ending, and we're like looking at each other and saying, no, that's not possible. <laughs> and we, we can laugh about that, but that in fact is a picture, I think, of what's going to happen at the end of time, when we have all these people who made all these false assumptions, they've interpreted all the data in a certain way, and in the end, just like Bruce Willis, they're going to come to see, I was wrong. None of this is, none of these assumptions I've made are real. It's just the opposite. Uh, and it's just like when you watch the movie, you go back through the scene saying, no, I can't be true. I, I remember that scene there. Is that proved? And you go back and look at it and says, no, that, I, 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 I misviewed that. I misinterpreted that. Uh, and so that's what's sobering, I think, when we look at this whole issue of hell and what people's expectations are. Uh, a great resource for this is, is a book by C.S. Lewis called The Great Divorce. Has anyone read that? It's sort of a, 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 a a parable of sorts. I highly recommend that because a really good perspective on this whole concept of heaven and hell uh, and the fact that people in hell are there by choice, okay, uh, and the dynamics of that. So I encourage you to look at that. Uh, let's look at also doubt from false expectations. Uh, look at a few of these expectations in Scripture. Think about Nathan. What... what uh, you remember he had leprosy, he came to get healed. What was his expect, expectation? Does anybody remember? He expected he was going to come to the king. The king would go through all his gyrations or bless him. And basically he was told, or Nathan, what was he told to do? Go get in a dirty river. Did that meet his expectation? No, it did not, did it? What about John the Baptist? He said, or should we look for another? What were some of the expectations that maybe John had? He had some expectations that maybe weren't kind of aligning with reality. What about the followers of Jesus? Remember in John 6, after he had fed them, uh, and he started talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood, did that, kind of, did that align with their expectations? No, it says many of them left after that. Uh, what about Mary and Martha after Lazarus died? What were their expectations of Jesus? That he wouldn't let that happen, right? You, you know, how could you do this, Lord? I mean, I thought, I thought you were our friend. Uh, do we somehow have expectations like them sometimes? Remember, Peter uh, basically rebuking Jesus says, no, you're not going to Jerusalem. That's not going to happen. He certainly had some a false expectation. Think about even the disciples on the road to, to Emmaus. They're talking to Jesus. Says, yeah, but we had hoped something else would happen. So they had a different expectation. Uh, what are some reasons we have these false expectations? Let me enumerate a few of those. We have a faulty view of our own intellect. We tend to think we're much smarter than we are. Some people more than others. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we have a faulty view of our own righteousness. We think we're much better than we are. Uh, we have a faulty view of our really our needs. We think we need something when God says you need this over here. We have a faulty view of God's love, his fairness, his justice. We have a faulty view of the Bible sometimes. We turn it into a charm, okay, instead of God's word. And we have a faulty view of the gospel as well, uh, that we've kind of touched on briefly. Uh, so some other questions I run into sometimes relative to expectations. Why doesn't God simply show up sometime visibly and dumbfound the skeptics once for all? Do you ever feel yourself wondering that? Wouldn't it be nice if he just Jesus showed up here? That would really help our faith and we'd be set for the rest of our lives, right? He did do that <laughs> once. Good, good, good point. Uh, no. Well, think about that. God revealed himself directly to Moses, then the Israelites through miracles, then the tab, tab, or 
tablets of stone. Then he, he led them through a pillar of smoke and fire. How did they react? They were complaining and then ultimately said, hey, you know, Moses has gone too long. Let's build a, a golden calf, okay? So we kind of laugh at them sometimes, but I suspect we're very much like them, okay? Uh, and then just like the, the parable we did, or the story that, that Jesus told uh, about the rich man Lazarus, Jesus said, I gave you all this stuff you're not going to believe anyway, okay? You don't understand how depraved you really are. Uh, I love this quote by Frederick Butcher. He says, Without somehow destroying me in the process, how could God reveal himself in a way that would leave no room for doubt? If there were no room for doubt, there would be no room for me. Because we're really the source of doubt. Okay. Um, so why isn't God more audible about his will? Why doesn't he speak more clearly? Well, look at this. If you remember, if you really go back and look at Exodus, Jesus, I mean, God basically came to speak directly to the individual Israelites. And they said, no, no, this is too much for us. You speak to Moses, okay? So they didn't want to really hear from, from Jesus or from God. Uh, and then it says God spoke through his judges. They ignored their kings who sinned and their prophets who killed. He kept trying to speak to them. How did they react? Just, just rejection. Finally, he came to speak in person. How did they react to Jesus? They crucified him. Somehow we think, you know, if, if Jesus speak, spoke to me, then I would listen and just obey and those other people. But, you know, Scripture says we, we are just corrupt at, at heart. Well, it also gets back to misaligning with their expectations, which undermines their faith, Right? Uh, I think we, we all tend to do that in our Christian walk. The older I get, I look back and how many expectations I have that God has to um, reveal that I was wrong, I guess is the best way. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, another question I, I see sometimes... I is uh, why doesn't God consistently punish evil people and reward good people? Uh, if you go back and look at the whole Old Testament, God created a quote-unquote fair system. If you do this, then I will do that. Those that don't do that, they will, they will receive curses. Those that do good things will receive blessings. How did that work out? Did, did the fair system work out for the Israelites? No, God used that, at least Paul talks about Galatians, how God used that to show people that you're incapable of, of obeying the law. All right? So a fair system is not going to work for you. You're incapable of fulfilling a fair system. Uh, ultimately, if God was fair, what would happen? We'd all be destroyed if God was fair. So I, I kind of laugh, not... Not too hard, but when people say God's not fair, it's like, well, if God was fair, you wouldn't be here. Do you realize that? Uh, so instead of fairness, God has given us grace. Uh, sometimes, though, we develop this idolatry, uh, idolatry of expectations. I like this quote by Eugene Peterson. It says, Jesus does not always appear to meet our expectations, does not always give us what we ask or what we think we need. When he doesn't, we feel let down, deflated, disappointed, or we surf to another channel on the television, or we try to find another church that will hopefully give us what we ask for. Is that sometimes true, you think? Okay. Let me go through a few more expectations that people have. Uh, what happens when people witness a good and faithful believer suffer horribly for, quote-unquote, no good reason? How does that affect a person's faith? Or how can that affect a person's faith? Well, they feel like they don't deserve that. Okay. Struggle with it. We do struggle with it. Okay. Uh, what's kind of the expectation underneath that? If God is really good, he would not allow Christians to suffer. That's kind of what we're thinking, right? Don't you, you agree? And yet scripture says all kinds of things about suffering uh, in 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about that one of the reasons we suffer is to show God's power in us and also that 
we might be uh, reflectors of God's glory to other people when they see a Christian suffering and that God is sustaining them, that becomes a witness of God's glory to them. Uh, what happens when you read a, mil, a real atheist who is not immoral or unhappy with their life? How can that affect a person's faith? Right. Uh, do sometimes people see that and they say, well, how can God exist if he allows these bad people to be prosperous? That's an argument that goes way back to the Old Testament. You look at a lot of the, the, the prophets and struggle with that. Okay, uh, Maybe what's one of the false expectations? Not Christians are extremely happy and moral people. That's what we assume. If you run into one that's not, then that can create sort of a, a dissonance in your belief system that can maybe undermine your faith. Uh, and yet the Bible says God blesses everyone uh, equally. Uh, and people have morals implanted in them by God, so it's not surprising or shocking that people tend to behave morally, right? Uh, what about if someone witnesses corruption or hypocrisy in a Christian institution? Of course, that never happens, but... The expectation is if Christianity is truly authentic, then there would be no, there would be no corruption in Christian institutions. Do we believe that as Christians? Why is that? But sometimes if you, if you have placed again your faith in an institution instead of God, and that can be undermining of your faith. Uh, and there's examples, obviously, where there are corruptions of, of teachers. Uh, witnessing Christians act in an unloving way, uh, that can undermine people's faith if they have an expectation that if Again, Christianity is truly authentic, then Christians would always treat people with love and respect. So I changed that question there. At the end. <laughs> okay. And that's sad when that doesn't happen because we're undermining the witness we give to other people. But again, that can undermine uh, people's faith. Well, why should I believe in your God? If God was real and Christianity is real, you would expect to see this and... and this is what I see, therefore, this incongruence supports my, my disbelief. Okay, uh, And in Scripture, we see God has strong condemnation for those that, that claim they're following Him and are not. Uh, another example, I believe the Bible and God let me down. This can kind of go back to sometimes when we latch onto a proverb or a psalm, and then we say, well, I believe the Bible and it didn't happen, therefore God has let me down, or God will never, and I see this a lot of time too, God will never put more in me than I can bear. Has anybody heard that statement or said that? I tell you, if you have a nervous breakdown, God has put more on you than you can bear. Okay? So that statement is not true. What is true is God provides the resources for you to survive, but it's not you that's providing the resources, it's God that's doing those. But a lot of times when people have overwhelming crises in their life, if they believe this, then what do they believe? God has somehow abandoned them, which just compounds their suffering. And that the suffering then is coming out of a false expectation that we have that's not biblical. Um... And again, I have this example in 2 Corinthians. Uh, another example, I obeyed God's laws and God let me down. This gets back to this expectation that if I do X, God is obligated to do Y for me. Um, and again, it goes back to our understanding of what the real gospel is. We, we don't have a gospel of works. We, we just subconsciously kind of slide into that thinking in our lives. We need to constantly be realigned back to the God to God's truth on that. Any thoughts on any of those? Do you see how all these types of assumptions and expectations that we somehow have, even sometimes subconsciously, can be setting us up for challenges to our faith? Do you see how that can, that can happen in the lives of our children or friends? And so we need to be careful and make sure that our friends and our children's faith is being built on solid biblical foundations and not false expectations. It's good to engage in conversations to try to ferret those out 
to make sure that, that things are not creeping in because we have a whole culture that is bombarding uh, our, our Christian friends, our Christian families with lies and falsehoods that can have some very detrimental effects. Okay, the last one I'll look at briefly is doubt from ingratitude. Uh, just some examples of ingratitude we see in Scripture. We talked about the Israelites when they left Egypt, how they were very ungrateful. Hosea gives a, a, a graphic example of that. Jesus is saying, I gave them all these blessings, and yet they just totally rejected me and forgot me. Uh, and then in Jeremiah, one of my favorite passages, it talks about how people have abandoned God uh, they have forsaken him, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewn out cisterns for themselves that can't hold water. What a, what a, a graphic description of our culture today, I believe. Um, and here's a good quote I like by O. Guinness that, that talks about this specific topic. He says, when a person comes to Christ at an early age or out of a Christian background, so that, this is I think relevant to a lot of people I've seen that walk away from their faith, that would be the, the case in their situation. I think that's also important as us, as we're raising our kids in a Christian home, to be aware of this potential danger. It says, when a person comes to Christ out of an early age or a Christian background, they, they may tend to underestimate their dire need of salvation or come to think that they're really not that bad and this God is the one who should be grateful that they've chosen him. And I'm sure no one explicitly thinks that, but I suspect even us sometimes we might think that. Um, invariably, this type of thinking leads to a doubt of God's greatness and then his goodness, which leads to an attitude of resourcefulness that eventually grows into a mood of self-sufficiency and then self-autonomy, which ultimately leads to an attitude of resentment. Like H and N Israel Instead of being thankful for God for rescuing us from slavery, we become resentful that he has taken away the idols of our slavery, which we now prefer over him. Or, while well, I've done all this work, I'm ready to do this, I'm ready to go, why aren't you using me? Maybe it's because he's more concerned about you than what you can do for him. Uh, he wants to transform you. To, to reveal who he am, who his self is. And, and what I've found, what, which might seem somewhat paradoxical the older I get, that one of the great instruments that God uses in people's lives is suffering. Uh, I, I've got a friend of mine that sometimes complains about some things, and I've frequently said to him, I said, uh, you know your problem? You haven't suffered enough. Because suffering creates compassion, it creates humility, and many times God needs to get us into that place before he's ready to use us. Because anytime we think we're going to serve him because of something I've got, then we're still not tro totally trusting in God, we're still somewhat trusting in our own ability or, or something that we have. And God knows that Unless we're totally broken, uh, his glory is not going to be maximized in us. Uh, but I think sometimes we have this culture um, in evangelical circles about you have to, you know, you're to be trained and you, you have all this stuff and then God uses you and stuff. And I suspect that's not exactly how God works. And that, get, again, gets back to one of these expectations that we develop. Uh, so how can we develop a a uh, attitude of, of gratitude. Uh, I think the last page, I gave you a bunch of possible suggestions, some different resources and so on. I'm going to be sending some of these out to you by email this week. Uh, but just certainly memorizing at, uh, verses and meditating on verses about gratitude, keeping a daily journal of what you're thankful for. Uh, a good example of that is a book by Ann Voskamp. Has anybody read that? Called A Thousand Gifts, where she starts going through and just writing down things she's thankful for, and the book is a compilation of over a thousand things that she identifies. And she hasn't had exactly the, the easiest life either, so that makes, I think, her 
her testimony much more powerful as a result of that. Uh, just serving other people can start to uh, build in you an attitude of gratitude. Um, on two ways. One, you see people's response positively and negatively. When you see a negative response, it, it convicts me of how sometimes I react to God when he blesses me. Uh, and I'll send you a great essay by um, uh, one of the writers this week that, that talks about that. Uh, the two other books I like, one of our just mentioned here, A Thousand Gifts, uh, and then a, another book I found really good is a devotional book is by Elizabeth Elliot called Keep a Quiet Heart. Uh, another person that's gone through a lot of suffering and tries to kind of recenter us on things to be thankful for. So just to briefly summarize, we've talked about doubts of the heart, specifically looking at doubts from false assumptions. I think a lot of times that just comes from bad information or knowledge, both biblical doctrinal truths that we, we don't know or just experiential, experiential truths that you gain uh, a lot of times, I think, from suffering. We have assumptions and God takes us into situations because of his love for us that those assumptions are basically taken away from us, which can be very painful. Uh, and so God can... Uh, Help us from that. Doubts from false expectations can be, in many cases, based on a lack of humility. We think we know everything, uh, so we expect things from people or from God, which really kind of comes from a, 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 a sense of pride that leads into a lack of, of, of uh, gratitude. Uh, and so I just leave you with those three things to think about. Uh, are we... Are you, are you building your, your faith on a solid foundation of, of doctrinal truth? Do you have a sense of, of pride or humility? Uh, and if God's going to use you, he will not use a prideful person. Uh, and just think about how grateful you are to God. How grateful have you been this last week? If someone was to evaluate your actions, your thoughts, your words this last week, would they conclude you're a grateful person or not? Uh, so a couple of things to think about. So let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. I'll send you all some more materials. Did anybody, everybody get all those materials this week? Yeah. Everybody read every, every piece, right? <laughs> so. Okay, good, good. All right, Stan, good to know. Uh, let's, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear God, just thank you so much for um, your love for us, your faithfulness to us. Lord, help us to... Uh, clear away, or Lord, we ask you to clear away those false assumptions and expectations that we have somehow kind of cobbled together in the uh, foundation of our faith. Help, help us to be receptive as you change and, and take those pieces away from us and replace them with your truth. Lord, help us to be uh, humble servants and to truly be grateful and thankful for all that you've done for us. Uh, most importantly, the gift of your Son and our salvation. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.